go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, I am Tanya Janka, and this is Kaslin, and this is Nancy, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But most importantly, welcome to the OWASP DevSlop show. DevSlop like sloppy DevOps, that's us. And we have an amazing guest today, and we are going to talk about containers. And I'm going to let Nancy take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Nancy Gashi, one of the project leader as well. And um, I work as a cyber risk analyst for the government of Canada. And today for the DevSlop show, we it's a special day because, uh, yes, you know, the DevSlop show tries to uh, introduce security into DevOps to experiment and explore, but we've never really looked into containers. So today uh, we have a very special guest to tell you, us all about it. Um, we're firm believers that it's important to understand how things work before and while we're trying to secure them. So we're trying today to give a good foundation about containers. So that's why we inv invited Caslin, Caslin Fields, sorry, um, Caslin, Caslin, okay. Caslin Fields, sorry, um, who is a cloud advocate for Oracle. So she creates articles, tutorials, and other materials to help her customers uh, in their cloud native journey. Uh, she's also a very, very talented artist and uses her talent in her spare time to create comics, um, to explain tech concept through fun analogies. So we'll go through that today. So welcome, Kaslin. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get the hang of it. <laughs> yeah, one Thank day, you. one day. <laughs> welcome. So what are we talking about today? So today we're going to talk about all kinds of cool container stuff. I'm going to try to give you all kind of a basic overview of what containers are. So if you want to dig into any particular part of containers, if you really want to become a container security expert or anything like that, you'll have a solid baseline to start exploring. So shall we get started? Yes. Absolutely. That sounds awesome. Thanks for being on our show. <laughs> yeah, happy to be here. And so today, like uh, you all mentioned, I'm going to be starting off with some of the comics that I've created to help people understand the basics of containers. And I think, did I share my screen? I shared, yep. I shared yes. the wrong screen. Hold on. I shared the wrong screen. <laughs> what? Why does it want me to wait? Do you all see the comic? Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's because I have the comic full screened. It looks like it's on the wrong screen. Anyway, <laughs> I just set up my new monitors in my office, so there might be some technical difficulties today. Bear with us. So the first comic I created on this topic is called Explain Like I'm Five, Containers versus VMs. And this is an analogy I came up with for a video that Oracle was doing. They wanted me to come on and talk about containers, and I've been con explaining containers for like five, four or five years, five or six years maybe at this point. <laughs> and I tend to find that it's kind of hard to remember all the basics. I would often be explaining this to uh, salespeople who are going out into the field to talk to their customers and their customers wanted to talk about containers. So the, the salespeople would be like, hey, give me a quick overview of containers so that I can talk about it intelligently with my customers. And when you're going out to a customer, you have so many things to remember <laughs> that remembering all this stuff about containers was not at the top of their list. So I was like, how can I make this more interesting and easier to remember? Uh, so that's where this comic begins. Usually you explain containers using some kind of diagram like this one. <laughs> and this is how I learned about containers. So it's got like the infrastructure layer and it's got hypervisor for VMs and then all this stuff. And then the same sort of thing with containers that are a little bit different. And you're supposed to kind of uh, get all the benefits of containers from that. Uh, but I found it a little difficult to remember remember when I was learning it, and I think a lot of other people do too. So instead, I decided to explain it using cookies. <laughs> and this actually came about, it's funny, I was going to be on that video, and I was like, man, I wish I had some kind of really cool visual to help people get containers. It would be cool if we had cookies, because cookies are delicious, and we could eat them on screen. But how could I tie that back to containers? So I actually went from cookies to containers rather than the other way around. But it works. 
<laughs> so this is our cookie bowl and we've got uh, all of our containers and VMs in our cookie bowl. So the bowl itself is also part of this analogy. So whether you're running containers or virtual machines, you've got to be running them on some kind of physical host. So that physical host, that infrastructure you're running on is like the bowl. It has a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of CPU. It has a certain amount of resources that you can use to run containers and VMs. So you can run containers, you can run VMs, but you can only run so many of them. So that's why it's like the bowl with limited capacity. Uh, where is it? And also, I mentioned in this one that it, if we want to change bowls, it would be better to move them if they're baked up in a cookie form rather than being uh, a bunch of ingredients in a bowl, which would not be very pleasant to stick your hand in and try to move to another bowl. So if we bake them up, they'll be easier to move. Okay. So if we look back at that diagram from earlier, mm -hmm. both VMs and containers are going to be cookies in this analogy. Um, but VMs are like bigger cookies with a lower chocolate chip to other stuff ratio. So <laughs> uh, the cookie itself is made up of your application that you actually want to run. And the goal, whether you're running a virtual machine or a container, is usually to run some target application. Uh, but unfortunately, that application also needs other stuff to run. It has dependencies. And so packing all of that up into a single package, you can get either a VM or a container. But for VMs, you need to have a whole guest operating system. So for example, if you wanted to run Linux on your Windows machine, you would run a VM because you can run the whole Linux operating system inside of that VM. Whereas with containers, you're making use of some of the functionalities of the underlying Linux kernel. This is primarily Linux uh, containers that we're talking about here. And so you don't need that whole guest operating system. And since operating systems are pretty big, they take up a lot of resources, this makes our cookies smaller. Mm -hmm. Also important to note that it makes our cookies bake up faster. So uh, containers tend to spin up in a matter of maybe seconds. Whereas if you want to spin up a virtual machine, it's going to take you a few minutes. So that's that. And then we take this analogy a little bit further. I mentioned earlier, the chocolate chip to other stuff cookie ratio. So that application that you actually want to run is like the chocolate chips. They're the best part of the cookie. They're what you really want. <laughs> <laughs> but Honestly. You have to put in all this other stuff. It's not really unfortunate. I love cookies. So <laughs> really makes it better in a lot of ways. Think about it. Mm -hmm. So our primary application that we want is these chocolate chips or chocolate chunks in this case, and all of the binaries and libraries that it depends on, and the guest operating system in the case of virtual machines are the rest of the stuff, the flour, the butter, the sugar, all of that. And then for containers, you just have your application, the chocolate, and then all of the binaries and libraries because you don't have to have that guest operating system. Uh, so yeah, they're but smaller. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> no, so far it's great. I want to check. Um, I want to take a second to just check the channels to see if. Okay, yeah. so it says hi, and I'm gonna say hi. Mm -hmm. It's gonna make me sign in, and I forget my password. So we'll see how this goes. But Nancy, do you want to check um, the DevSlop channels? Yes, absolutely. Which no question on my side for now. Cool. Okay. I just like um, didn't want to go away from the awesome stuff that you were talking about. I was just like, no, I want to keep doing this. Yeah, well, this is a good break point. So I've kind of explained what containers and VMs are in this analogy. And the next, I'm going to talk about a use case. OK, cool. I like it. Cool. OK, so there's nothing in the chat room. OK, no, we're all so everything's pretty clear. If you have clear. questions, feel free to put them in chat out yes, there. Please, please do. Land. We're watching for them. <laughs> Happy to give them a shot. And we'll be going more in depth into containers with my next comic and with the demo that I'll show off in a little bit. Awesome. But so we've learned a little bit about what VMs are like and what containers are like with this cookie analogy. So keeping this cookie analogy in mind, what does this mean for you? 
So let's say that you're a system administrator. And a system administrator's job is generally to support some development teams by making sure that they have all of the applications, all of the resources that they need. And the system administrator makes sure that all of those applications are running on actual hardware somewhere, somehow. Development team usually doesn't really care that much about that part, but the system administrator does. So basically, your development team are a bunch of chocoholics. <laughs> <laughs> They don't really care how they get their fix, but they need chocolate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need the applications, but they don't really care what form they come in. So you, as the system administrator, have a choice. You can uh, spin up those applications on hardware somewhere and just run them straight up. But at some point, you're going to have hardware failures. You're going to have to deal with system upgrades. You're probably going to have to move those applications at some point. So baking them up into cookie form is going to benefit you as a system administrator later. So you want to bake them up into cookies, but do you want to bake them up into virtual machine cookies or container cookies? And I submit that you should bake them up into container cookies because the container cookies spin up faster, they use your resources more efficiently, and uh, you can hopefully satisfy your developers' needs without having to request budget for another bowl. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I'm loving the analogy. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> I'm getting Actually, hungry. Actually, I saw someone say on Twitter that uh, ever since they saw this talk, which I gave at KubeCon, I gave this comic as a five minute lightning talk, which you can also find if you want to. It's kind of the same thing. Um, they said ever since they saw it, whenever they're using Kubernetes, they think about the cookies. <laughs> So we'll talk about Kubernetes a little bit later. I don't have a comic out for that yet, but the new comic that I have, and I have to go up the other direction so you get a preview of it, <laughs> is about uh, containers from a system engineer's perspective. So this goes a little bit deeper. I mentioned we're talking about Linux containers and that containers make use of some Linux kernel functionalities so that they don't have to have that whole guest operating system. So this comic talks about those Linux kernel functionalities. So before we go into that, do you all want to check and see if we have any other questions online and me take a drink of water? Yes. <laughs> Just go ahead and drink your water. Let me check it's on Mixer. Switch. I'm all good on that side. And so is cool. YouTube. That was a very like basic core concepts, core value proposition overview. So that very makes clear. sense. Now we're going to get into some deeper stuff. Awesome. So, in this comic, our applications are now dogs. <laughs> so this is an ex example of our applications in their natural environments. <laughs> so instead of chocolate, now we're talking about dogs. So our yes. applications are dogs. Okay. Yeah. Following. Small preview. I'm going to be making a, a Kubernetes comic soon, and that's going to go back to the cookie analogy should be fun. <laughs> but to talk about the operating system, uh, I actually went from the technology to the analogy this time. So <laughs> to talk about the operating system and the Linux kernel functionalities, we're talking about applications as dogs. Okay. And in their natural environment, they might look something like this. They have the whole living room to themselves, all the toys and food they could possibly want, and the humans wrapped around their little fluffy tails. <laughs> so basically, these apps are pretty spoiled. This is kind of like apps running on their own physical hardware. Okay. They have the whole house and all of the humans, all of the resources to themselves. Ah. <laughs> but let's say we wanted to run our applications more efficiently. If we wanted to have a bunch of applications in one place all sharing resources, that would be kind of like a doggy daycare. <laughs> So you've got all of your dogs, all of your applications, sharing the same space, sharing the same toys and food, and also interacting with each other. <laughs> so with the doggy daycare, they're sharing infrastructure, like the building, and they're sharing uh, resources, but they're being cared for by the operating system. And the operating system's role generally is to make sure that applications have all of their needs taken care of. 
have all the resources they need and are doing well, just like the staff at a doggy daycare. But with dogs interacting, we tend to see some problems. Dogs don't always get along, especially when they're being forced to share resources like food or toys, or sometimes dogs just don't get along with each other with no particular reason. And this is also true for applications in our whole uh, infrastructure environment. You've got a fixed amount of CPU, you've got a fixed amount of memory, and sometimes your applications will fight over that. Say one of them really wants a lot of memory and hogs it all, then some of your applications might not get what they need. So how do we solve these problems? So we could solve it with a virtual machine. And a virtual machine basically pretends that you've got a whole nother machine. Like we mentioned earlier, it's got a whole separate guest operating system on it. It also emulates all of the hardware. So it pretends it has its own memory and CPU. So whatever is running inside that virtual machine can't go beyond what it thinks it has as its own machine. So for example, you can have one box here, but you can have it running multiple different operating systems. So in the doggy daycare terminology, this would be kind of like each dog getting its own townhouse. The townhouses <laughs> share infrastructure, but from the inside, it looks like its own house. So you're sharing some pieces, but the dog doesn't really know that. Mm. But most people probably wouldn't build a row of townhouses just for dogs. <laughs> I mean, if you really, really love that dog, maybe. But uh, for the most part, that's not really what we're going for here. We want to be more efficient, like the doggy daycare. So what changes can the doggy daycare implement to help the dogs get along? Well, first off, if they're fighting over food and toys, we can make sure that each application, each dog, is has its own set of toys and its own food bowl. So if we were talking about that in computer terms, you would have a total amount of CPUs and a total amount of memory, kind of like the toys in a toy box. And you specify that application X can only have maybe one CPU, and that's the max it can ever use. And you can specify a certain amount of maximum memory that it can use. So this is called C groups in Linux. That's the tool that allows you to specify uh, a limit on the amount of resources that you can use. So that's great. We've made sure that they all have their own toys and food, and they'll go all get along, right? I think so. Of course not. <laughs> that's not enough. <laughs> if you know dogs, they just yeah. sometimes they just don't like each other, and that's true for apps too. There are all sorts of weird ways that they can just not get along. So sometimes you just need to separate them. So in computer terms, this is going to be namespaces. And this is kind of like putting your apps all together in their own pen or in their own uh, kennel. So you can put one app by itself, or you can put several apps in a group. And there are various different types of namespaces, which I'll show off more in a minute, um, that allow you to kind of compartmentalize different aspects of the system for your, your applications. Anyway, so namespaces let you separate the dogs. So there might be some cases where just using namespaces and C groups and containerizing your applications isn't what you want, and you really, really want your application to have its own house or its own townhouse. <laughs> but for the most part, uh, just containerizing them up will allow them to get along pretty well. So that's it for my analogies today. And next we're going to... I love your analogies. Demo. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. And your that. comics are really good. Thank I, you. <laughs> to me, that's drawing sort of a mystery and like laying everything out with... It's nice. It's really good. I definitely... <laughs> I think I have to send this to a few people. Yeah, and if you want to, by the way, feel free. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, my website is kaslin.rocks. I'll give you all a link later. Cool. You want to see it. So you can always go ch check out these uh, comics. And someone asked me at KubeCon actually if they could use my artwork in their own presentations to help their 
teams understand uh, containers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, sure. If you want to grab stuff from my blog, feel free. Later, I think I'm going to create a GitHub repo where I'm going to put the art assets. So hopefully I'll do that in the next couple of weeks. So if you would like to check out my artwork, maybe add me on Twitter and you'll get notified when I do that <laughs> or join my mailing list on my website. Also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are there any questions before I move into the yeah, chat? Yeah, let's check that. So I'm, I'm not seeing, um, so I'm trying to monitor on my phone <laughs> instead of constantly switching to the, um, <laughs> so there, so there's nothing on the Shex purple site, um, but I haven't, yeah. Okay. So cancel this. Um, but I do want to put your, hi, Ray, <laughs> um, Haslam.rocks. That's pretty excellent. Yeah. <laughs> pretty excellent. It's a pretty great URL, right? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. I like it. And I think yeah. we're going to have to share it from our Twitter as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I have considered doing containerized adventures because that's what I wanted to name the comic series. And mm -hmm. that's what I call it, what I call the site. But containerized adventures is such a long URL. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, definitely. I do have uh, Ken two two nine that says I love the concept in the comics. It's a great way to explain the subject. So, no questions, but a comment from Ken two two nine. Thank you, Ken. Just awesome. compliments. Thank you, Ken. That's it. <laughs> yeah, just love. I'll take it. I'll do. <laughs> so now we've learned some basics through analogies. But next, we're going to see what this looked like in the real world with some demos. So we talked about namespaces. So I learned about uh, C groups and namespaces from just going to a lot of container conferences and stuff and hearing people talk about containers. And they'd be like, oh, yes, C groups and namespaces. That's what containers are made of. And I'd be like, oh, yes, C groups and namespaces. I know what those are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to learn more about them. So I started looking up some tutorials, and there are a lot of great tutorials out there if you want to learn about these uh, Linux kernel functionalities that enable containers. Uh, for example, Liz Rice, who works at Aqua Security. Mm -hmm. So she's a great resource if you really want to learn about container security. She does a ton of talks, uh, teaches a lot of really cool concepts. She has one talk that I've seen several times uh, about building a container from scratch, and she uses Go to do that. So if you're interested in Go, also might be something you're interested in. She has all of her resources up on GitHub. Um, but what I really wanted to know is how to use it on the command line. So I tend to find that with Linux tools especially, uh, you can learn a lot about what the creators were thinking by what they named the command line tools and how you use the command line tools. And that's true for namespaces. So the namespace command is called unshare for namespaces. So if we think about the analogy that we were just talking about, why would it be called unshare? So the default clearly is that your uh, processes, so there's a bunch of different types of namespaces that I mentioned earlier. So there's process IDs, uh, users, uh, IPC, what that analogy is for, but anyway, or the acronym is for, but anyway. Uh, so there's all these different types, mount namespace, UTS namespace. I think IPC is the new host name namespace thing. Anyway, so there's all these different types of namespaces and we're unsharing them. So the default is that you're in this shared space of all of these different pieces, but if you wanted to break any of these pieces out into their own pen, So I'm going to show off the PID namespace. Uh, for security, the user namespace is really interesting with containers, because if you happen to be in a container as a user in your container, of course, and then you break out of your container into the full uh, 
actual system of the physical host or the virtual machine, because you can run containers on virtual machines. If you're not in your own user namespace, when you break out, you will be that user in the system. So if you were root in the container, you'd be root in the system. So that would be bad. <laughs> so user namespaces are really important for security. Today I'm going to show off uh, the ID, but definitely look into that. So I just did a PS ox to list my processes that I have running on this machine. And as you can see, there's a lot. There's nothing here that I'm trying to point out in particular, just that this is kind of what it looks like on the normal host. So if we were to run a namespace for process IDs, it would be unshare, and you have to be sudo to run uh, namespaces, which actually Liz Rice has an interesting talk about uh, having to be root to create containers. And uh, they've come up with this concept of rootless containers, where you can run containers without having to be root, which I don't understand that much about, but she gives a talk on it. And I think that there was someone else at the same conference who was talking about it in more depth. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, certainly something you can learn more about. Cool. So we're going to fork off a PID namespace. Dash dash mount. Talk bash. So we're going to create a bash shell for this namespace. Did I typed it wrong. Dash D. I don't know what I did wrong, but I'm just going to copy it and hope that it works this time. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. So now we should be in the process ID namespace. So if I were to do PS aux again, you can see there's only two processes running in this namespace. And that's because we're not on the main system anymore. We're in this little kennel where we can only see a few processes. So let's exit that. And if we want to, we can show that we've exited it and we're back in this space with all these processes running. <laughs> so that's kind of what namespaces look like on the command line, very basically. And like I said, if you want to learn more, you can check out Liz Rice's talk or um, uh, Julia Evans is how I found out how to do these command line things. Yeah. So there are actually a lot of uh, blog posts out there about using code to create containers. Mm -hmm. but Doing it through command line, I found relatively few resources, but Julia Evans has a great blog post on it. Yeah. She's also an artist. This coming she comics is. just like yeah, you. She also makes comics. <laughs> yeah. It's great. <laughs> if you haven't checked out Julia Evans' work, definitely check that out. I was also going to mention another talk, which I will find the name of the speaker real quick. Uh, the talk is called Containers, No, Not Your Mama's Tupperware <laughs> by El Marquez. Uh, so she's another one that explains namespaces and C groups really well in that talk. So I'll give you all a link to that later. But I wanted to mention that. So now we're going to talk about C groups. <laughs> so C groups are another interesting one. I forgot to save it. So the usual way that you create C groups, or kind of the original way that you create C groups, is actually with a mount command. That tells you again something about what they were thinking when they created C groups, that it's actually a directory that you mount uh, that enables you to limit the resources that you can use. But there's also this group of tools that you can get, like CG. Let's see. Yeah. So I've installed this uh, tool packet. If you were to type in like CG create. What I did was I typed in CG create, trying to go through these uh, steps, C group create, and uh, it was like, you don't have that installed. So I just installed the package that it recommended. Uh, it's a group of C group tool utils kind of thing. So it gives you all of these different tools that you can use to create and manage C groups. So if you wanted to create a C group, you would do something like, sudo, once again, you have to be root to do this. Uh, hello. So this is what a command looks like to uh, create a C group using these utils. 
Mm -hmm. And if I were to do that, oh, oh yeah, I have to have my user set up and everything. I haven't messed with the C group utils very much, <laughs> just to kind of do that demo. Uh, and I messed with it this morning and changed some things, so I might not be able to do this right now. But if you want to check it out for yourself, Julia Evans walks you through this. Um, so that's what the command kind of looks like. You have to specify your user and uh, what type of C group you're creating and all of that. And it allows you to specify a uh, limit on the amount of memory that you want to allow people to use or other things. So check out Julia Evans for the rest of that. That one's kind of broken for me right now. So I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> No worries. Yeah, we're we're cool. Live demos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you've watched a couple of shows of ours, we, we yeah. have experience in that and <laughs> things not, not the first working. Time that's happened to you? No, no, not at all. <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> we're good. Um, so this is the Linux kernel functionalities I was talking about earlier, the namespaces and the C groups, and these are the two Linux kernel functionalities that you will hear mentioned most about containers. There are some other ones that factor in. Uh, but these are the two that you should really know about. So now we're going to move into the container worlds. So C groups were created in um, 2007. So these containers, as we kind of know them now, have been around for some time, really. And the first project that we tend to think of as containers, though there were uh, Solaris uh, zones and FreeBSD jails. Uh, LXC is the one that comes to mind for a lot of people, and LXC is the Linux Container Initiative, I believe. And so they were one of the first projects to uh, really create this concept of containers in Linux. They basically took C groups and namespaces and did some scripting around it so that when you want to run something, it's, and the goal was to be kind of like a virtual machine. So these Linux containers, usually when you talk about containers, you talk about Docker. And Docker does things a bit differently from LXC at this point. When Docker first launched, it used LXC, but people got excited about it because it made, uh, running containers so much easier, so much more approachable. So I tend to talk about Docker as a usability company more than like a technology company, though they did some really cool stuff with containers. Um, but so this, we're going to talk about LXC a little bit. And it's funny, there are actually several command line clients if you want to run LXC style containers, which are often called machine containers. So these are meant to be more like virtual machines. They require that you have a full file system. So it's not a full operating system, but a full file system, which means that the images for LXC containers tend to be a bit bigger. Um, so the command is LXC to work with these uh, Linux containers. So there are actually also a couple of other command line clients that you could use. Uh, but technically it's using LXD so like I said, Docker came along and made containers easier to run. And uh, Linux, the, the Linux container group was like, well, we could do that. So LXD is their attempt to make uh, LXC containers easier to run. Uh, it's a new API that makes things a little bit simpler. So this LXC command line tool now references the LXD API, which allows you to create LXC containers, because that's not confusing at all. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to create an LXC style container, you could do LXC launch. And I'm using this tool just because it was what was already on my Ubuntu system when I spun it up. And this is a, a Linux Ubuntu VM running in Oracle's cloud, by the way, just because that was easy for me to spin up. So let's say we want to run Ubuntu 18.04, and we'll call this container low. So we've got LXC. We're going to launch a container with the Ubuntu file system. And then uh, we're going to call it hello. 
So it's going to be creating that. These containers are also generally a little bit slower than Docker containers, in my experience at least. But uh, while I was researching this for this, I started talking to some of my coworkers. And one of them has actually switched recently from using Docker containers for all of his home automation to using LXC containers, which I thought was pretty interesting. So he did that because he wanted something that was more like a virtual machine, but he didn't want the full weight of a virtual machine. So he decided to use LXC because they have this type of persistent. So this refers to the way that it uh, maintains data. So a lot of people will know if you run Docker containers and then your Docker container dies, then all of your data is gone because they're meant to be kind of this microservices architecture. And when you run an application in the container, once the container goes away, you want that to be fully gone. LXC didn't take that approach with this persistent type. And uh, they will keep that data around in a directory somewhere. I don't know that much about it yet because I just learned this from talking to him because he decided to use LXC containers instead of Docker. Uh, but if you're interested in that, LXC might be something that you want to look into. So if we wanted to get into this container and do something interesting with it, we would do LXC exec. Oh, yeah, I called it first before, but this isn't my first one, so I called it hello this time. <laughs> and then we would run bash. So now we're root inside of that container and we can, I don't know, do things in it. What processes it has running? Lots of them. Lovely. Interesting. I wonder how they set up the namespaces for that. <laughs> so that's a Linux container. So if you want to learn more about those, I'd encourage you to check out LXC's website. And uh, the L Marquez talk I mentioned earlier, she also talks a little bit more about LXC containers. So I'm just going to kill this container now. And stop uh, first again. LXC stop. Hello. So this stops the container. Oh, yeah. I'm inside the container right now. Exit. <laughs> LXC stop. Hello. So this stops the container from running, but it still exists. And then LXC delete. Uh, hello. And that'll delete the container. So it's not there anymore. I guess I could have done an LXC list so that you saw it when it was in a stopped state, but now it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. That's good. So that's LXC. Now we're going to move into Docker, which when most people talk about containers, they're talking about Docker. Or they're talking about Kubernetes, which we'll get into in a second. So, and with Kubernetes, they're actually usually talking about Docker still. <laughs> so Docker like I said, they made containers a lot easier to run. They came out like five or six years ago. Uh, so I actually got into containers because someone who sat near me was really excited about Docker. They were like on it from day one when they released Docker. So, and they wanted to talk about it to anyone that they could. <laughs> An early <Hi>, adopter. <laughs> and so I had him give me a spiel about this thing he was so excited about. And now here I am on a podcast talking about containers. So <laughs> that worked out well. Yeah. So if you wanted to run a container with Docker, this first, maybe I should do Docker so that you can see. So this is the Docker command line tool. It has lots of interesting capabilities and uh, made containers really easy to run. And Docker actually started out with LXC, and then now they've implemented their own kind of way of doing things to help them focus more on applications rather than trying to be like virtual machines. So they kind of made it their own thing. And they use container D and run C to do that if you want to look into the technologies that enable Docker containers to be what they are. So if you wanted to run a container with Docker, you would do Docker run, specify a name, uh, my Nginx. So I'm going to run an Nginx container here. That's a really common demo container. I'm going to specify a port. I never remember which order it is. Uh, 
I think it's 8080 is the port on the container and then 80 is the port on the host. So we're forwarding from the container to the, the host port. So if you were to hit port 80 on the host, you would get Nginx that's actually running inside the container. And we're gonna, why do we have a dash D? Nginx. So dash D detaches it so that it doesn't take over your command line. If you didn't have the dash D in there, once you run this, it would take over your command line. And when you hit control C, it would kill the container. <laughs> you don't want that. So dash D is an important thing to remember when you're running things. Oh yeah, and I didn't sudo it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we've got an Nginx container up and running with Docker. You can see that this output looks quite a bit different from the LXC output. Uh, it tells you what port is up and running, how long it's been up and running, the name of it, which is kind of all jarbled up because I have my font so big and everything, but is what it is. So that's what a container looks like running in Docker. So if we wanted to exec into it and do some interesting things like we did with the Linux uh, container, the IT LXC container, this is technically also a Linux container, but the LXC container, then you would do docker exec dash IT, which means interactive, and then uh, Nginx. I think I have it named my Nginx, right? My Nginx. And then the shell for it is slash bin slash sh, which I didn't sudo again. <laughs> <laughs> I should really have just done super user for this, but whatever. So now we're inside of the container. So we can ls and you can see all the stuff that's inside of this nginx container. I wonder what PSAUX would show with this one. Yeah, it's not found because it's not a, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a minimal shell. So it's interesting. So that's what it's like to create a, an nginx docker container and then exec into it. And exec is the same verb that uh, LXC used as well. So that's easy to remember. So now if we wanted to delete that, like we did the LXC container, we'll do docker stop uh, my nginx sudo every time. There we go. Oh, I guess I could PS this time. So it doesn't show up if you do that, but if you did dash A, it would show you that as well as several others that I tried out yesterday when I was practicing this. <laughs> <laughs> Proof. Nice to have a uh, history. Yeah. <laughs> so then we, we would delete the container. Oh, what is it? I tried several things yesterday because I couldn't remember. I usually kill them because uh, I'm bad and don't stop them because I think Kill, yeah, kill will also stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, and rm. Pseudo docker rm my nginx. Go me for not putting that in my notes once I actually finally figured it out. <laughs> so that's an intro to containers, uh, different container functionalities from the Linux kernel, as well as different types of containers. And there are several other types of containers as well. For example, Singularity is one I hear about a lot because it's used for high performance compute workloads. So if you're interested in different types of containers, there are several out there, but Docker is kind of the default. So now... Other than the high performance one, is there a, a reason you would go for anything other than Docker? Is there, a, it's just a preference or... So I did find it really interesting that my my teammate decided to use LXC for his at-home workloads. He just found that simpler. So, oh, I didn't show it here. I meant to show. You can see it in L. Marquez's uh, demo. I think if I were to pull a different image, I'm going to try something real quick. Box. Yeah. So if you run a container for the first time, this isn't a particularly interesting one because BusyBox is tiny but you would see a whole bunch of numbers like this pop up. And that's because Docker builds your container incrementally. So it builds your container in layers where each layer is a 
uh, delta, the differences from the original operating system. So you build up all these differences until you get the container that you want. So this creates a bunch of intermediary containers, which if you're not careful about how you create your layers, that can take up a lot of extra space and you can lose some of that efficiency you were trying to get by using containers. So he didn't really want to deal with all of the layering stuff. He wanted something that was a bit more like a virtual machine. So he decided to use LXC instead, which was pretty interesting. Uh, Aside from that, there's another project uh, that was designed to be a container, an open source container uh, to be used with Kubernetes, which a lot of people are interested in these days. So if you're interested in that, I believe it's called Creo, C-R-I-O. Uh, you might look into that one as well. I, don't, okay. uh, I haven't, I've mostly used Docker because that's what most people are using at this point. Uh, but actually, Kelsey Hightower switched his Kubernetes the hard way uh, GitHub repo, if you haven't yeah. heard of that. Very popular way to learn about Kubernetes. He switched mm -hmm. that to use Creo. So really? Did he it. say why? Did he announce why he, he made the switch? Or? So he works at Google, and uh, Docker technically is a company. So there's an open source version of Docker, which is called Docker Community Edition. But they also have an Enterprise Edition. Mm -hmm. Whereas Creo is a totally open source community run project. Okay. And I think that's why he chose it, because it's okay. totally open source community run, has no mm -hmm. business component. Yeah. We like open source. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And awesome. the community edition is open source, but it is also related to a company. So to a company. <laughs> fair. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Are there any other questions about containers? If we well, have. Joshua, if you want to do something else, then I can show off uh, Kubernetes. But yeah, it's up to you all. <laughs> well, in um, in the chat in uh, YouTube, Joshua was asking for your um, analogy earlier. What if a dog wants more resources? What does so, he have to do? Yeah. At that point, observability and monitoring might come in. So you might want to set up your containers and. I don't. So Kubernetes doesn't do this right now. I don't think any container uh, thing or tool forces you to do this right now. But it might be a good practice for you to set up limits on all of your containers to start with, and then monitor them and see if they're hitting those limits, because they would probably output some kind of out of space error that you could watch for, and then say, OK, well, I need to up the limit on this. But as I created the container in this demo, mm -hmm. it didn't have any limits. It could just keep going. <laughs> however long it wants uh, and hog up all of your resources if it wants to. Okay. So uh, you have to specify the limits when you create the container. Okay. And, so. and when it hits it, you kill it and start another one. Is that it? That's generally the way that you do containers is they're replaceable. The whole cattle, not pets mentality of yeah. if something fails in it, then you delete it and start over. Uh, with resource limitations, I feel like that's a little bit Different. interesting because you have to be monitoring it and watch for it to die. And then, yeah, you would probably create a new one with the new limit would probably be how you'd get around that. We're actually having that problem with the Pixie module of our project where um, you download the virtual machine and if you just hack at it too much, it collapses and then you're just you end up having to like boot it up again and again and it's it's a it's nicole's part of the project and she's like been doing all sorts of other things and i'm like hmm, maybe we should play with those containers and like fix it yeah because it is for smashing and smashing is abusive and you need more than the average amount of ram yep so containers containers are for smashing <laughs> <laughs> Can we quote you on that? <laughs> <laughs> <Dangerous Dangerous magic. laughs> I think Jesse Frizzell would have some interesting uh, insight on that as well. Oh, so if you're interested in smashing containers and uh, seeing, learning more about the security aspects of containers, oh yeah, Jesse Frizzell actually created a project that's online. You can interact with the, the terminal through a website where she created this container and she's challenged people to try to break out of it. And as far as I know, no one has done it yet. I've seen so if it. you would like a challenge. <laughs> yeah, we should invite her on the show. She used to be on my team at work, and then she switched over to GitHub. Um, oh, yeah. She would make 
for a fantastic and amazing guest on the show. Yeah, Thanks. she is so deep into all of the how containers work. She could give you a really great overview of that stuff. Or she could just smash things and we could just sit there in awe. And like, that would <laughs> like just be cool. That sounds like Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So I'd like to go back to the beginning of your analogies and say, for some, um, why did you, what did we do before containers? So why is it? So yes, we you focus on the difference between VMs and containers, but why is it good news? Why are we now now using them? Yeah. So like I mentioned, uh, containers have been around for a while and. The problem that people were trying to solve both with virtual machines and with containers was you know, they've got this application, they're going to need to move it at some point, they want to encapsulate it within a machine and use that machine more efficiently as well as being able to move that application later. So the first way that we did that was, well, what if we made a whole separate daycare, right? <laughs> what if we built townhouses? And so that's how they created uh, virtual machines, sort of, in a very abstract way. <laughs> and then, uh, so we wanted to get even more efficient, as humans do. We want to make it better, faster, stronger. <laughs> so we created containers as a way to run these applications more efficiently while still keeping them portable uh, to a certain extent because uh, Linux containers were, of course, Linux-focused. So another interesting topic is Windows containers, which they've been doing all sorts of interesting things for the last several years to enable containers on Windows natively. Uh, so at first, they created a type of container where it translates things to the Windows kernel. So it's a totally different kind of pathway from Linux containers. So a Windows container would not generally work on a Linux machine and vice versa. Um, now I think they've done some interesting things with it, so maybe that's not the case anymore. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but so Linux containers were an uh, effort to make running things more efficient and portable, basically. Cool. Okay. And uh, so we have, I guess, also a smaller, when you say there are smaller cookies, we have a smaller attack surface for compare to VMs? It's a different attack surface. <laughs> so I've mentioned several times breaking out of containers, which is a danger. Mm -hmm. um, but with virtual machines, you're emulating the hardware and everything, right? So you don't usually talk that much about breaking out of them, because uh, there's just so much between you and the machine itself. So there's yeah. a lot of interest right now, actually, in running virtual machine uh, running containers in lightweight virtual machines to make them more secure mm -hmm. which i always find very interesting uh so they're trying to make virtual machines lighter and lighter and faster and faster so that they can run basically one virtual machine that all, all it does is run one container kind of thing okay and, uh, there's a project called kata containers which is a very popular way to do that uh, so what about GVisor? Wasn't that something to... Visor. Have That's you heard? No? that I've used. Okay. <laughs> so I've heard about that for kind of sandboxing because um, VMs don't have... Uh, VMs have hypervisor to prevent escaping, exactly. I guess, uh, which the container doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, there's this concern of, you know, breaking out, like you've mentioned multiple times, breaking out of the containers. And yep. GVisor, I think it's from Google, uh, so they're working on something like to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to sandbox those containers to prevent um, escape, escaping them. But I haven't looked into them really. <laughs> yeah. So there's a ton of projects that are trying to solve this space because virtual machines are a more known quantity and they've got a lot of really great security features built in. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great security with containers, but it's different from what people are used to with virtual machines. We've got the namespaces and C groups. You want to make sure that if people break out of the container, you won't be affected, like I mentioned with users, or try to prevent them from breaking out of the container, like Jesse Frizzell's project. So it's a different set of concerns. Okay. 
pretty interesting. So would you say there's a space for both, for both containers and VM, and it's not about containers replacing VMs completely? Absolutely, yeah. That's something that people talk about a lot, is are containers going to replace VMs? Are people not going to be using VMs anymore? That's not really going to happen, I don't think. <laughs> and like some people would love to replace their virtual machines with containers, and some people have successfully. But in the end, they're fairly different things. And so they have fairly different use cases. And like I said, you can run containers in VMs. So they tend to coexist. Awesome. And that's the way things are going. We just have a few minutes left of the show, but I'd like us to touch on Kubernetes, just uh, maybe not the demo, but understand, because usually when we hear about Docker, the next thing you hear about is Kubernetes. So just understand what the concept is and, and why would you want to use that technology? Absolutely. So we've talked about containers a lot today mm -hmm. and containers seem really cool, right? You're using your machine really efficiently. You can spin them up really fast. So you might be thinking, oh, okay move all of these things into containers. So think about this from a company perspective. You're moving all of your workloads into containerized uh, architectures, microservices probably, which means that you're spinning up a lot of containers and a lot of different containers that do different things. And then some of those containers are going to be on fire, inevitably. <laughs> and you're going to have to be able to uh, deal with that in a case where you have containers at scale. So this is where Kubernetes comes in. So Kubernetes brings in a lot of tools that allow you to run containers at scale. And Kubernetes itself does not do containers. Like I mentioned, there's uh, the project creating containers meant for Kubernetes. The most common way right now is to run Docker with Kubernetes. So the demo I was just going to show running Nginx with the kubectl run command, which is running Nginx and Kubernetes. And then that's actually running a Docker container underneath. So Kubernetes provides things like being able to roll back really easily. Uh, it's declarative. So if you say, I want three copies of Nginx, one thing, it can make copies really easily. And then if any of those copies goes down, but you've said you want three copies of Nginx running, it'll make sure that three copies of Nginx are running. So if one of those goes down for any reason, it'll restart it. And by that, I mean, it'll kill it and create a new copy of Nginx. Uh, so it's really exciting because it makes running containers at scale easier with a bunch of cool tooling. So it's a platform to manage all of your containers instead of having to go through them individually, I guess. Yeah, instead of having to keep in mind all of the containers that you're running and use whatever tools you use to figure out which containers are running and which ones are broken and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Is Kubernetes um, the, uh, are they the only one in that space or uh, is it the only open source you know, uh, management platform? So there have been several others. Okay. Docker Swarm was a big one that people talked about, uh, which was from the Docker company. It was also open source, I think. Yeah, but there's a, an enterprise edition of it as well, uh, which was for running containers at scale, but they started theirs out a little bit later. So Kubernetes is based on what Google was doing, and Google has been using containers since well before Docker. Hmm. So they have a lot of great tools for running it. Uh, so this uh, Kubernetes project came out of what they had been doing and was released open source, and it has kind of become the de facto standard. And so that's what everyone talks about these days. <laughs> awesome. Thank yeah. you. That's all I have. I don't have any more questions in the chat. Which um, is perfect since it's 11. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're at the end of the show. Do you have anything on your side, Tanya, before we No, wrap I'm up? looking at I'm not seeing anything. So awesome. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. That was fantastic. Good introduction. Thanks for having to me. Containers. I hope everyone learned something new. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So Tanya, anything you want to talk about before we we leave? Any announcement? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Nancy and I spoke at AppSec, uh, Global AppSec, the OWASP conference in Israel, and we did a talk there. And we're planning to share that so that you can reproduce our talk elsewhere if you want to. And it's a demo of a bunch of different security products and they're pre-recorded, so you don't have to do lots of work. And so we're going to share that on our repo soon because we 
want you to be able to nerd out with us, basically, as much as possible. And if anyone has any, you know, we do lots of things. If anyone has any specific um, requests for our project, please let us know. People, people kept asking about containers, and Nancy said, I am on it. <laughs> the direct result yeah. of your request. Yes. So we can have more amazing people like Haslin and uh, other awesome like containers, Kubernetes, VM alternative folks. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we want to thank our wonderful guests. And thanks for having me. <laughs> Yes. Um, and I really want to, sh we're going to share lots of links about her so that you can, Absolutely. all of our audience can like follow and learn more about her because clearly she has a lot of cool stuff. Um, I want to thank Nancy for just being Nancy. And um, <laughs> so we are part of, this show is part of the OWASP DevSlop project. So DevSlop like sloppy DevOps and OWASP is this huge community, the open web application security project. And we cover more than just application security. Clearly, we cover Kubernetes, uh, containers, infrastructure, cloud, all sorts of things, because we're trying to figure out how to make everything secure from a, like a software type of custom IT perspective. And so this show, we're allowed to make mistakes. This one actually went really, really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'll so we can we're participating in our project as usual. And um, yeah. Does that sound good, Nancy? Speaking that sounds fantastic. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So again, uh, we'll share all the resources that Hazelyn uh, talked about. And even if she has more that uh, she wants to share with you guys, we'll add them to the show notes. Thank you very much, Hazelyn. Um, you know, we've been talking for a while to get you on the show. Um, I would check out, also you have um, a talk, I guess, that you gave at KubeCon, a lightning talk that she gave at KubeCon in Barcelona. That's really cool. It's a quick watch on YouTube. I'm pretty sure you can find that. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And yay, no, no technical difficulties. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Awesome. So we do our wave, our goodbye wave. Yep. Goodbye wave, everyone. <laughs> goodbye wave. Bye, Caitlin. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Let me stop sharing.